Early on a gray Monday morning, a young surfman named C.P. Brady sat watch at his post at the United States Coast Guard Station number 183 at Cape Hatteras. Aside from the nearby lighthouse, the two-story Cedar Shake building was the highest point in the area, with a view of the notoriously treacherous Diamond Shoals. Midway through Brady's watch, as the morning light slowly illuminated the mist, he saw a shape appear from the darkness. A massive, fully rigged, five-masted schooner soon emerged. The ghostly vessel, thrashed by the waves, rocked from side to side, stranded far out on the shoals, looking like a specter from another time. Neighboring stations Big Kinnikeet, Creed's Hill, and Hatteras Inlet were all alerted and asked to stand by while the Cape Hatteras surfmen sprung into action and prepared to rescue the stranded sailors. But when they arrived on the beach, the January winds and heavy surf made it impossible to reach the stranded schooner. She was far enough away that they couldn't make out her nameplate or home port through the mist, even through a spyglass. With no way to reach the ship, and apparently no one on board needing rescue, the surfmen had no choice but to wait until the weather cleared before they could investigate the ghost ship that sat stranded on the Diamond Shoal. They wouldn't board the mysterious vessel for another five days. In 1866, William Donnell and Gardner Deering partnered to start a small shipyard in Bath, Maine. Both men were sons of shipbuilders, and they started out building small schooners, fishing craft, and other coastal vessels, quickly gaining a reputation for quality and fine workmanship. After 20 years, Gardner Deering took full control of the shipyard, and in 1905, he formally brought in his children, Frank, Harry, Lydia, and Carol, into the business as partners forming the G.G. Deering Company Shipbuilders and Ship Agents on May 6, 1905. By then, the company was building large four- and five-masted schooners and continued this work through World War I, completing approximately one vessel every year. By the end of the war, the company had named a ship for each of Gardner's children, and in 1918, construction began on the company's grandest vessel yet, to be named for the now 86-year-old's youngest son, Carol. The Carol A. Deering was a bit of a relic when she was launched on April 4, 1919, built long after nearly all new commercial and passenger ships were steel-hulled, steam-powered vessels. But in a lot of ways, the Carol A. Deering was the pinnacle of Gardner Deering's long shipbuilding career. The oak-framed, five-masted schooner was the largest vessel the yard had ever constructed. Her Oregon masts were 108 feet tall with 46-foot top masts. She was 255 feet long with a beam of 44 feet, and with three decks, she came in at 1,879 tons and was operated with a crew complement of 11. She carried an incredible 6,000 yards of sail and featured a steam engine on her forecastle called a donkey that could raise and lower her twin anchors and hoist her massive sails. She also carried two small lifeboats. While the Deerings didn't christen their ships with champagne, Carol's wife Annie called out, I christened the Carol A. Deering as the massive schooner slid into the Kennebec River. The Carol A. Deering was co-owned by the Deerings and several investors from throughout the Northeast. She was commanded by William Merritt, an experienced captain and a hero of the Great War. The schooner began her lucrative voyages transporting coal from the United States to South America. Within her first year, she earned her owners over half of their initial investment, but her promising start would soon come to an abrupt end. The Carol A. Deering left Hampton Roads, Virginia on August 26, 1920, with a load of coal bound for Rio de Janeiro. But on the 2nd of September, she made a stop in Delaware, where 54-year-old Captain Merritt took a hotel room to recover from a sudden illness. After five days, Captain Merritt still hadn't recovered, and he decided that he couldn't continue the voyage. It's also reported that he didn't like the ship's crew and didn't wish to sail with them. His previous crew refused to sign back on for this voyage, aside from first mate Seawall E. Merritt, who was Captain Merritt's son, and engineer Herbert Bates. The replacement crew was a hastily gathered group of unfamiliar Scandinavian sailors. With his father seriously ill, Seawall Merritt sent a wire to Gardner Deering back in Maine, requesting a relief captain. His Portland neighbor, the highly experienced schoonerman Willis B. Warmel, was suggested for the job. Captain Warmel was 66 years old, and he had been retired for six years by this time, 
but he remained on call as an interim captain for occasions such as this one. When he received the telegram from the Deerings asking him to perform one last run, he was on vacation with his wife and their daughter Lula Wormel. He quickly accepted and headed to Delaware to assume command. On September 8, 1920, Captain Wormel signed on with the Carol A. Deering. Joining him was a new first mate, Charles B. McClellan, a hastily located sailor from Boston. They soon began the long voyage to Rio, arriving there in November without incident. While in Rio, Captain Wormel had dinner with an old friend, fellow Captain George A. Goodwin. During the dinner, Wormel told his friend that he had a worthless first mate and his second mate wasn't much better, but he said that if anything bad occurred, his engineer, Herbert Bates, was a fellow Mainer and would have his back. The Deering left Rio on December 2, 1920, and stopped in Bridgetown Harbor in Barbados for his supplies. As they dropped anchor, first mate McClellan got into an altercation with Captain Wormel apparently screaming, I'll kill you before it's over, old man. The captain ordered McClellan off the ship, where he and the rest of the crew began a five-day bender on shore. While in Bridgetown, Captain Wormel told another captain, Hugh L. Norton, master of the schooner Augusta W. Snow, that he was having serious trouble with his first mate, who was habitually drunk on shore and unable to handle the crew properly, treating them with what Wormel felt was totally uncalled for levels of brutality. Captain Norton recalled that Captain Wormel was in excellent health when he spoke with him, but other witnesses reported that the old captain didn't seem well. He told Captain Norton that he would sail the Deering no further than Virginia. Once there, he would head home to Maine. Captain Wormel also confided in another captain, G.W. Bunker. The two openly discussed the possibility of mutiny, and while Wormel was seriously concerned, he felt that he could trust his engineer, Herbert Bates and having one man on his side would be enough to get them to Virginia. Captain Bunker wasn't so sure, but Wormel also felt that the ship being empty kept him safe because there was no cargo for the crew to steal, removing any financial incentive for mutiny. After his meeting with Captain Wormel, Captain Norton would soon cross paths with first mate McClellan. Norton claimed that McClellan seemed at least partially sober at the time. The first mate claimed that he was having serious trouble with the crew but Captain Wormel interfered whenever he tried to discipline the men, so he felt that he had no authority to do his job. He also claimed that because of Wormel's poor eyesight, he had to do all of the navigating on his own. McClellan then grew desperate and told Captain Norton that he needed a new ship. He asked if Norton would sign him on as mate, but Captain Norton, of course, refused, judging McClellan to be of poor character. McClellan then immediately proved him right when he got angry at the refusal and began shouting. Captain Norton, his first mate, and the captain of another vessel all reportedly heard McClellan yell out another threat. Well then, I'll get the captain before we get to Norfolk. I will. McClellan's drunken bender was reckless enough that he finally got himself arrested. Ultimately, Captain Wormel decided to forgive him. He paid his bail and had him brought back to the ship to dry out. The Carol A. Deering raised anchor and left Bridgetown for Hampton Roads, Virginia on January 9, 1920. What happened to her over the next several days remains a mystery. By the morning of Friday, February 5th, the weather was clear enough that rescue crews were able to approach the mystery ship. The Coast Guard cutter Manning and a salvage tug called the Rescue soon arrived on the scene. As they drew near, they could finally read her nameplate, Carol A. Deering of Bath, Maine. The Coast Guard repeatedly called out to the derelict schooner, but they received no reply. With no signs of life on board, the Coast Guard gave the rescue's captain, James Carlson, the okay to board the vessel. Captain Carlson and four of his men boarded a small boat and motored over to the schooner's port side. They climbed a single rope and boarded the ship. The men marveled at the sight of the ghostly schooner. Waves washed over her decks and spilled into her holds. By this point, her hull was giving way to the unrelenting surf, and she seemed to roll in opposite directions, not long from breaking apart. Her keel was measured to be buried nearly 14 feet into the sea floor. It was clear that there would be no hope of salvaging the nearly brand new schooner. Captain Carlson and his men began searching the ship. The wind had shredded two of her topsails, but this likely happened while she was stranded on the shoals. Her two anchors and one of her anchor chains were missing. As the men moved aft, the mystery grew. They found that someone had been preparing a meal in the galley, with a pot of pea soup, a pan with slabs of spare ribs, and a pot of coffee on her stove. 
Stranger still, they found that her steering gear was ruined and her wheel was broken. The binnacle box was smashed in and shattered. The rudder was disengaged 15 feet from its stock. Nearby, a nine pound sledgehammer was found. But Carlson wasn't sure if the hammer was used to destroy the ship's equipment or if someone was attempting a repair. He also wasn't sure if some of this damage occurred before or after the ship's grounding. Her two boats were missing. Both davits and falls were way out over her sides and the boats had been cut from their falls. She had two red lights high in her rigging, a signal that meant the ship was in distress. Below her quarter deck, Captain Warmel's cabin was in a state of disarray with clothes strewn about and the bed unmade. It appeared that someone was using the spare room meant for guests of the captain. In the chart room, two or three pairs of rubber boots that didn't seem to belong to the captain lay scattered about on the floor. His trunk and other personal belongings were all missing, as were the ship's navigational equipment, log, and other papers. The crew's personal effects were also gone. Captain Warmel's Bible was found, and Carlson had it sent back to his family. Three cats, nearly starved to death, were also found and rescued from the ship. Captain Carlson, an experienced salvageman, had no idea what to make of the strange scene he found on board the Carol A. Deering. The mystery of what happened to her crew and why they abandoned a perfectly intact and valuable ship would soon become a national obsession. The Carol A. Deering's departure from Barbados was not the last time she and her crew were sighted before running aground in North Carolina. On the afternoon of January 29th, the Cape Lookout Lightship spotted a five-masted schooner approaching from the south. After days of wind, storm, and fog, the weather was finally clearing. Impressed by her beauty, the lightship's engineer, James Steele, took a photo as the schooner drew near. A red-headed man called out from the ship using a megaphone and said that they had lost both anchors in a gale off frying pan shoals and asked that the lightship convey word to their owners. The man's appearance and manner of speaking didn't seem like that of a captain or an officer, and he spoke with a Scandinavian accent. As the schooner sailed past at around four knots, Thomas Jacobson, the captain of the lightship, also noticed that several of her crew seemed to be milling about her quarter deck, a space typically reserved for the captain. The lightship's wireless set was not working at the time, so they would ask the next wireless equipped vessel to pass on the schooner's message. Almost as soon as the schooner disappeared on the horizon, a steamer with an antenna for wireless equipment approached from the south. Captain Jacobs quickly raised the letters RQK to signal that he had an important message, but the steamer didn't slow down. The lightship let out four blasts from its steam whistle, another widely honored signal to establish contact. But immediately following the signal, the steamer changed course away from the lightship, and the men on board hastily covered their nameplates with canvas. Captain Jacobs was greatly unnerved by the strange event as the mysterious steamer disappeared on the horizon, following the same course as the Deering. The final sighting of the Carol A. Deering was equally mysterious. On Sunday, January 30th, only one day before the Deering grounded, Captain Henry Johnson of the steamship Lake Yvonne sighted a five-masted schooner. Though they couldn't see her nameplate, the location and their description of the vessel suggest they must have seen the Deering. Captain Johnson reported that while there was nothing out of the ordinary about the schooner's appearance, her course was strange as she appeared to be steering straight for the dangerous shoals around Cape Hatteras. While it was an odd sight, Captain Henry assumed that the crew of the schooner would soon spot either the beacon from Cape Hatteras Light or the lightship at Diamond Shoals. Not thinking much of it, the Lake Elon continued on her course as the wayward schooner sailed out of view. Soon, numerous investigations were launched to determine what happened to the crew of the Carol A. Deering, including one led by future President Herbert Hoover, who was then the Secretary of Commerce. He wanted to know why so many vessels from numerous nationalities all seemed to have disappeared in roughly the same area at around the same time. As the Deering was the only one of these ships to reappear, it was hoped that she could offer some clues. But it was soon concluded that many of these disappearances could be explained by a series of severe hurricanes in the area. As the Deering's course was traced, it appeared that she was sailing away from these storms. That led her investigators to believe that mutiny was the most likely explanation. 
until a startling revelation was uncovered. A local fisherman named Christopher Columbus, Gray, soon came forward with a message he found in a bottle in the waters off Buxton Beach. The message read, Deer and captured by oil-burning boat, something like Chaser, taking off everything, handcuffing crew, crew hiding all over the ship, no chance to make escape. Finder, please notify headquarters Deering. The letter seemed to confirm that the Deering fell victim to piracy, a theory backed up by the mystery steamship seen by the Cape Lookout lightship. The story was further legitimized when it was found that the bottle containing the message was manufactured in Brazil, and the handwriting matched that of the Deering's engineer Bates. But as the letter was further scrutinized, its authenticity soon fell into question. While the handwriting was said to match Chief Engineer Bates, it soon became clear that it also matched someone else's handwriting, Christopher Columbus Gray. And after further questioning from federal authorities, Gray soon admitted that he had faked the letter. Apparently, he thought the discovery would help him land a coveted job at the Cape Hatteras Light Station. Somehow that actually worked, because he did end up getting a job with the Lighthouse Service. So, I guess petty crime does pay. Another popular theory at the time was that the Deering did indeed get caught up in the hurricanes that ravaged the area. This idea was popular among most government officials, particularly the Weather Bureau. With both of her anchors lost and her steering gear damaged, it's thought that the crew raised the distress signal found on her wreck and soon hailed a sulfur freighter called the Hewitt, which was known to have been in roughly the same area at the time. The crew then evacuated the damaged schooner for the relative safety of the 5,000 ton steamship. The Hewitt last made radio contact on the 26th of January, 1921. No further trace of the vessel has ever been found. If she picked up the crew of the Deering, they met the same mysterious fate that claimed the Hewitt and her crew. In addition to bad weather and piracy, mutiny is another widely held theory. The tension between Captain Warmel and First Officer McClellan was well documented and supported by several witnesses. It's believed that after something sparked an altercation, Captain Warmel and maybe Engineer Bates were murdered in a fit of rage. The crew then lived on the ship for a bit longer before abandoning the schooner, knowing that their crimes would soon be found out. In the small boats, they were at the mercy of the seas, churned up by the nearby hurricane. They might have been lost there in the sea, but maybe with some luck they made it to land. They hid the boats, and they blended back into society, lost forever to the anonymity of history. The story of the Carol A. Deering and her missing crew made headlines all around the world. Journalists poured over the various explanations, from the mundane to the supernatural. Several connected the disappearance to a story about a Soviet plot to seize American ships. Anti-communist anxieties were reaching a fever pitch at the time, but there's no evidence that this plot, if it was even real, was ever carried out, and there's nothing tangible linking it to the Deering. A much more mundane theory is that after suffering damage in the storms, the Deering grounded with her crew on the Diamond Shoals, and they abandoned her in the lifeboats sometime in the night before the schooner was spotted. Then, the tiny boats broke up in the heavy surf, drowning the men before they could reach land. Without much else evidence, and no traces of the crew ever turning up, the inquiries were soon closed without any definitive conclusions. Captain Warmel's daughter, Lula Warmel, unsatisfied with the lack of answers, fought her entire life to keep the story in the press and pushed investigators to follow every possible lead. Her efforts are a big reason why we know so much about the mystery today. In the months that followed, it quickly became clear that the Carol A. Deering was beyond saving. Various parties removed anything they could from the Phantom ship, and after an attempted salvage, she was deemed a navigational hazard and her wreck was destroyed with dynamite on March 4, 1921. Portions of her wreck washed ashore, and it's said that some of her timbers were used by locals to build houses in the area. The Carol A. Deering was the last ship built by the G.G. Deering Shipyard. Gardner Deering would die at the age of 88 later that year. His legacy is now kept alive by a mystery that tantalized the nation and confounds investigators to this day. On the afternoon of Friday, November 21st, 1902, 
Captain James McMaw of the Lake Freighter Algonquin peered through his binoculars into the haze that hung over Lake Superior. Despite the low visibility and mild gusts, the weather was nothing too challenging for the upbound Algonquin. Around 80 miles off Keweenaw Point, Captain McMaw sighted the silhouette of another freighter making her way downbound about seven miles away. He immediately recognized the steamer's three-masted profile. It was a vessel the experienced captain knew well, a 245-foot wheat carrier that frequently shared the same route as the Algonquin, called the Bannockburn. This late into the season, there were not many vessels left on the lake. Captain McMahon noted that the Bannockburn wasn't towing her two barges, probably due to the likelihood of rough late November weather on these final runs. He recorded the sighting in his ship's log and noted that she seemed to be making good weather with nothing unusual to report. A minute or so later, Captain McMahon raised his binoculars to take another look, but the Bannockburn was gone. Baffled by the sudden disappearance, he scanned the horizon over and over. It would have been impossible for any vessel to sail out of view in just the brief moment in which he looked away. But the Algonquin was alone in the vastness of Lake Superior. There would never be another confirmed sighting of the Bannockburn ever again. Only the day before, the Canadian registered freighter Bannockburn was loading grain at the Canadian Northern Elevator at Port Arthur. She was preparing to carry 85,000 bushels of wheat to Midland, Ontario in Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. The SS Bannockburn was a British-built ship constructed at the Sir Railton Dixon and Company shipyard in Middlesbrough on the Tees Estuary in 1893. She came in at 1,620 tons with a length of 245 feet or 74.4 meters and a 40 foot or 12.2 meter beam. She was powered by a triple expansion three-cylinder engine fired by two boilers. Not long after her launch, she arrived in Canada to join the Montreal Transportation Company fleet based in Ontario. The grain trade at the time involved frequent transiting of the Welland Canal and the small locks at the St. Lawrence River, which limited the size of vessels in the fleet. The Bannockburn was about the maximum size of a vessel capable of operating this route. On this voyage, she was commanded by 37-year-old Captain George R. Wood from Port Dalhousie, Ontario. While this was his first season on the Bannockburn, he spent the previous year commanding another company vessel, the Glengarry, and was considered an experienced navigator by this time. In a strange coincidence, his brother Eugene Wood was chief engineer on the ill-fated car ferry Marquette and Bessemer No. 2, which was lost in a storm on Lake Erie on December 8th 1909. The rest of the crew was very young. Of the 20 other men, 33-year-old Chief Engineer George Booth was the only married man on board. The next oldest crew members were 24-year-old First Assistant Engineer Charles Selby and the 22-year-old Second Mate William Chalky. Selby had just been elevated for this voyage after the previous First Engineer abruptly left the ship only a few days before. A new Second Assistant, Joseph Dawson, was brought in at the last minute. The rest of the crew ranged in ages from 17 to 20. The youngest crew member was the wheelsman Callahan. He was an orphan working on board to support his three younger brothers. He was just 16 years old. At the time, it was extremely common for Great Lakes shipping companies to employ young and inexperienced crews so that they could keep wages as low as possible and maximize profits. It was an extremely lucrative business. As the Bannockburn finished loading, Captain Wood remarked to the elevator superintendent, Mr. Sellers, that he expected good weather on this run, and he thought they might even be able to get another one in before the end of the season. Mr. Sellers, a man with many more years of experience, doubted this very much, observing that ice was already beginning to build out from the shore. He knew that the season was already coming to an end. The Bannockburn departed Port Arthur on November 21st, 1902, at around 9 in the morning. She was actually scheduled to leave a day earlier, but as she made her way to the open lake, she briefly ran aground and was forced to turn back. After a thorough examination, it was found that the damage was minimal, and she was declared perfectly sound and cleared to begin the voyage. After her departure, 
almost nothing is known about what happened on the final voyage. Her average speed and departure time would put her right around where she was sighted by Captain McMaw of the Algonquin. But aside from suddenly vanishing from view, the captain didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. Nothing that would hint to any trouble on board. As the Algonquin made her way up bound that evening, she soon encountered a stiff breeze and heavier seas, but she arrived safely in port without much trouble. As night fell, a storm descended over Lake Superior with towering seas and punishing winds. Captain McMaw felt lucky that he had made it to port before the worst of the November gale blew in. He pitied any vessel that might still be out on the lake. That night, the Northern Navigation Company's passenger steamer Heronic a sister ship of the ill-fated Neuronic, which would burn in Toronto Harbor in September of 1949, was sailing upbound to Port Arthur when heavy snow began to fall. A young waiter on board, Fred Landon, kept a daily diary of his experience. He noted that on the 21st, the ship encountered the worst storm of the season. The weather was so intense that the ship's engines were damaged and had to be repaired the next day. While he was serving breakfast the next morning, Landon overheard one of the officers remark that they had sighted the lights of the Bannockburn fighting through the storm during the night, but no one on board thought much more about the sighting. The Heronic arrived in Port Arthur and departed for another downbound voyage on the 25th. It wasn't until they arrived in Sarnia on the 28th that they learned that the ship that they had seen in the night had gone missing. Meanwhile, as the Bannockburn became seriously overdue at the Sioux Locks, a period of wild speculation and uncertainty soon set in. It wasn't uncommon for ships to get delayed, especially in rough weather, and at first, the Montreal Transportation Company wasn't concerned about the missing vessel. But as time went on and the families of her missing crew became more desperate, pressure mounted on the company to explain what happened to the missing sailors. In the days after the Bannockburn's scheduled arrival, no one seemed to know whether the ship was actually missing or just stranded somewhere. Engine failures happened somewhat regularly, especially during storms, and every couple of seasons a ship would go well past her scheduled arrival, only to be discovered sitting idle or grounded only a few days later. This was before ships were equipped with wireless sets. Communication was limited to as far as the eye could see. Once a ship passed out of visual range, she was lost until she was spotted somewhere else. On November 26th, a manager of the Montreal Transportation Company, Mr. L. L. Henderson, under mounting pressure from the families of the crew, claimed that he had received word from the office of the ship's underwriter that the Bannockburn was located on the north shore of Lake Superior, opposite Michipicoden Island, and her crew was safe. He said that the report came from a ship called the Germanic, a large salvage tug called the Favorite was sent to the scene to investigate, but after steaming for miles up and down the bleak shoreline, no trace of the missing ship was ever found. The officers of the Georgic were questioned about the report, but they were adamant that no one on board made any such claim. They went on to say that if any stranded ship was sighted, they would have investigated immediately to assist anyone who might need saving. It's very unclear where Henderson got his information, and when he was pressed for answers, he only became vaguer. If Captain Wood found himself lost in the storm, it's likely that he would have searched for the light at Caribou Island. He might not have known that the light was intentionally shut off for the season on November 15th. This early shutoff date would cause a great deal of controversy, since many ships pass through the area sometimes as late as the early weeks of December. Another tug called the Boynton was sent to search the shoals around Caribou Island and retrace the shoreline searched by the favorite. Again, nothing was found. And even before the Boynton returned, the Bonnockburn was officially declared lost on November 30th, 1902. Almost no trace of the Bannockburn or her crew were ever found. On November 25th, before the ship was declared missing, a steamer called the John D. Rockefeller sailed through a debris field near Standard Brock Light but it was unclear to the crew of the steamer where the debris came from. The only confirmed trace of the Bannockburn was discovered on Friday, December 12th at the Grand Marais Life Saving Station when a cork life preserver 
and a single oar from the ship were found on the beach. The total lack of information left few answers to the fate of the Bannockburn and the 21 men on board. Captain McMaw of the Algonquin theorized that she was taken down by a sudden boiler explosion. That was the only way that he could explain her suddenly vanishing from sight that afternoon. But there's no evidence to back this theory, and McMaw himself admitted that he neither saw nor heard any signs of an explosion. Boiler explosions, though commonly speculated about at the time, were exceedingly rare, especially in newer, well-maintained vessels like the Bannockburn. At the end of the season, when the lock at the Canadian Sioux was drained, a single steel hole plate was discovered. No one was able to definitively link the plate to the Bannockburn, but it led credence to a theory that she sailed into the gale with a weakened hull that failed in the heavy seas. But there's little other evidence to support this theory either, especially given that her hull was inspected just before leaving. The most credible final sighting of the Bannockburn came from the Algonquin, occurring almost exactly where the ship would have been expected to be at the time, given her planned course. The sighting was also properly recorded before the ship went missing. While the men in the pilot house of the Heronic were adamant that they saw the lights of the Bannockburn that night in the darkness of the raging storm, it's not clear that the light they saw was indeed the missing ship. The Heronic might well have been the last vessel to see the Bannockburn before she met her final fate. But as the years went on, they would prove to be far from the last sailors on Lake Superior to believe that they spotted the Bannockburn fighting through a dark storm in the waters around Caribou Island. Throughout the early half of the 20th century, the Bannockburn mystery sparked the imagination of superstitious sailors on the lakes. For years after the disappearance, on dark and stormy nights, sailors would frequently claim to see the lights of a phantom ship fighting her way down Lake Superior, searching for the light at Caribou Island. These strange sightings were almost always attributed to the Bannockburn, and she quickly earned the nickname, the Flying Dutchman of Lake Superior. But as the years passed, and those who sailed the lakes in 1902, aged and eventually passed away, the mystery of the Bannockburn all but faded into memory, replaced by more spectacular and recent disasters. But it's easy to see why her story was so captivating. In those early days, late season losses were common. Tonnage was easy to replace, and there were plenty of young men eager to work. The term ghost ship gets thrown around a lot, and people debate what it actually refers to. Is it a derelict ship left to drift without a crew? Is it a vessel that vanishes in the night without a trace, only to be spotted again and again throughout the years, hiding in the mist? It's an evocative idea that somewhere in the vastness of the seas and the lakes of the world, phantom vessels lurk just beyond the fog. A romantic notion that the young men who were sacrificed in the name of commerce somehow live on. The idea that a young sailor can continue in some ghostly realm lends significance to a life cut short by the pursuit of profits. Letting us believe that the sacrifice of a loved one was somehow worth it. On a cold night in 1933, a group of Inuit people came upon a derelict cargo ship drifting in the icy waters off the coast of northern Alaska. They decided to explore the abandoned ship to see if they could find anything of value. But almost as soon as they boarded, the winds shifted and a violent storm blew in seemingly from nowhere, trapping them inside. As the arctic winds raged outside, the small group had nothing to do but listen to the ghostly groans of the ship as she ground against the shifting ice. When the storm finally cleared ten days later, they fled, never to look back. The phantom ship would soon vanish. She would mysteriously reappear numerous times all over the Beaufort Sea for the next three and a half decades.
The SS Bechamo was originally launched in Sweden in 1914. Her original name was Angerman Elfen, after the Swedish River. Her original owners were German, and she was used as a trading vessel between Hamburg and Sweden through the First World War. She was relatively modest in size, weighing in at 1,322 tons with a length of 230 feet. She was powered by a triple expansion engine and could achieve a cruising speed of 10 knots. After the war, she was handed over to the British as a war reparation in 1920. She left the Baltic Sea for the last time and was purchased in London by the Hudson Bay Company for £15,000. She was renamed the Bechamo. Her first voyage with the company took place in 1921 in the Eastern Arctic. The next year, she was sent to Siberia with her new captain, Sidney Cornwell. He would remain her captain for the rest of her career. The Bechamo would spend the next two years trading furs in Siberia, but political tensions in Russia soon led the Hudson Bay Company to withdraw from the area. After 1924, she would begin operating in the Western Arctic, traveling between Vancouver and Hudson Bay Company posts along the Yukon and Northwest Territories. She would complete nine difficult voyages in the area carrying cargo and furs. She was typically manned by around 32 crew members and would occasionally carry passengers. Every winter, she would travel back to her home port in Adrossen, Scotland. She would return to Canada through the Panama Canal, and in 1924, she would also travel through the Suez Canal, successfully circumnavigating the globe. But her luck on these dangerous voyages would soon run out. The Bechamo experienced particularly treacherous weather conditions in her 1931 season. She would frequently find herself mired in fog and heavy ice throughout the summer. By late September, as she passed the Seahorse Islands near Point Barrow, Alaska, the Bechamo experienced an unexpected blizzard. Her crew was forced to drop anchor and weather the storm. But by October 1st, conditions continued to deteriorate and the steamship was soon trapped in heavy pack ice. Recognizing the dire situation, the crew abandoned the vessel and traveled half a mile through the snow to the town of Barrow, where they would shelter for the next two days. When they returned, the stricken vessel had broken free from the ice. The ship had sustained heavy damage in the storm, and it was clear that it would be impossible to safely sail her further southwest. Her crew decided that they would have to remain in the area to watch over her through the winter. But on October 8th, the situation grew even worse when the ship once again became mired in the ice, this time much more thoroughly than before. On the 15th, the Hudson Bay Company sent an aircraft to retrieve the crew but Captain Cornwell and 14 of his men refused to leave their ship behind. The company provided them with provisions to last the winter, and they constructed a crude temporary shelter nearby. They wouldn't dare live on board the ship. It was impossible to keep the large vessel heated, and the shifting ice threatened to sink her at any moment. Over the next few days, they performed daily maintenance on the ship, mainly clearing ice from her rudder to prevent damage. But their routine was cut short when on November 24th, a blinding storm struck the area. When it finally cleared, the Bechamo was nowhere to be seen. Captain Cornwell and his crew assumed that the powerful storm had sunk the damaged ship. They headed back to Barrow to await transport to Vancouver. But to their surprise, an Inuit seal hunter spotted the derelict vessel a few days later, trapped in ice near Skull Cliff some 45 miles away. Captain Cornwell and his crew tracked her down and concluded that the ship was far too heavily damaged to safely survive the winter. They removed her remaining cargo and abandoned their ship for the last time, knowing that she would probably break up in the brutal icy waters of the Beaufort Sea. Captain Cornwell and his remaining crew were flown back to Vancouver soon after. The SS Bechamo was officially deemed a loss and the men went on with their lives. But later that winter, to everyone's surprise, the Bechamo was spotted some 300 miles east of where she was originally abandoned. This would be the first of many mysterious appearances. She was next spotted by a man named Leslie Melvin. He was traveling to Nome with his dog sled team when he came across a ship floating peacefully near the shore. A few months later, she was discovered by a group of prospectors. At first, the sightings were an odd surprise, but nothing too extraordinary. The area was, and still is, extremely treacherous. It was not uncommon for ships to be overtaken by the ice and abandoned by their crews. Usually once a ship was abandoned, she would succumb to the elements in a few days or weeks. 
but occasionally one of these ships would survive a season or two before finally foundering. So when the bechamel appeared in the distance again and again over the next several months, locals didn't think much of it. But as time went on, and the derelict ship kept appearing, stories began to circulate that something supernatural was guiding the phantom ship. Those who spotted her would claim that it appeared that she was piloted by some unseen crew as she drifted away from rocky shoals and other hazards that would challenge even manned vessels. In 1933, her legend grew when a group of Inuit people were forced to shelter on the ghost ship when a freak storm trapped them in her hull for 10 days. These strange events helped earn the Bechamo a reputation as a cursed ship. Later that summer, she was boarded by the crew and passengers of the trader, a small schooner that was on a research expedition to collect Alaskan and Arctic wildflowers. So charming. After they finished exploring the ship, she disappeared in the night. But throughout the remainder of their voyage, the Bechamo would appear several more times, just on the horizon, as if she was following them. In November 1939, there was an attempt to salvage her by Captain Hugh Paulson, but his vessel was too small to safely take control of the much larger Bechamo. This was the last recorded boarding of the ship. She was spotted several more times throughout 1939, but she always eluded capture. Recorded sightings slowed considerably during World War II and in the years after. It was assumed that she finally succumbed to her long overdue fate and she was more or less forgotten. But then, out of nowhere, she was spotted by a group of Inuit people in March 1962, floating near the shore of the Beaufort Sea. Her last recorded sighting took place in 1969, when she was seen drifting in heavy pack ice, 38 years after she was originally left for dead. Though she hasn't been sighted in decades, her mystery continues. Her unnatural ability to remain afloat, unmanned, in one of the most treacherous bodies of water continues to baffle investigators. In 2006, the Alaskan government commissioned a project to solve her mystery, but to date, nothing has been found. The sightings we know about are only those that were recorded to history. How many others managed to explore the phantom vessel? What did they find when they explored her empty cabins or ventured deep into her cargo holds? Was she supernatural? How did she survive so long in the icy waters? And did she finally sink? Or is she still out there, drifting in some far-off forgotten stretch of the Arctic, waiting to be found once again? Late one night in 1909, while the SS Waratah steamed for Durban, South Africa, a first-class passenger named Claude G. Sawyer rose from his berth and walked on deck. The sky burned crimson and the sea churned below. On the horizon, a hellish figure arose from the sea, swinging a sword with one hand and clutching a blood-soaked rag with the other. As the apparition grew near, it called out Waratah again and again until Sawyer finally awoke from his nightmare. The next morning, he couldn't shake the sense of dread, and night after night, he had the same terrible dream, the same specter, crying out the word Waratah over and over again. 
When they finally arrived in Durban, Sawyer left the ship for good, ending his voyage early. He would continue his trip to Cape Town on another liner. Only a few days later, the SS Waratah, with 211 souls on board, would vanish without a trace. In 1869, William Lund founded the Blue Anchor Line. The company operated a fleet of sailing ships that primarily serviced routes between London, South Africa, and Australia. By 1890, Lund and his sons replaced their fleet of sailing ships with versatile steamers designed to carry both cargo and passengers. Their livery featured a black and white funnel with a distinctive blue anchor design. In 1907, the Lund family commissioned a new cargo and passenger vessel with the shipyard Barclay, Curl & Co. in Glasgow. The design was modeled after the SS Geelong, a 7,700-ton liner launched in 1904, but this new liner would be nearly 2,000 tons larger making her the largest and most luxurious ship in the Blue Anchor fleet. Yard number 472 was launched on September 12, 1908, and christened by Mrs. J.W. Taverner, wife of the Agent General of Victoria and a person whose name no one seemed to think was important enough to write down. The SS Waratah came in at 9,339 tons with a length of 465 feet and a beam of just over 59 feet. She was powered by two sets of quadruple expansion steam engines that drove two screw propellers, achieving a service speed of 13 and a half knots. She was equipped with a double bottom and her hull was divided into eight watertight compartments. She featured luxurious accommodations for up to 128 first class passengers with well-equipped staterooms, a saloon, and a music lounge. Her third class accommodations could hold up to 300 passengers. The Waratah was designed to function as an immigrant ship with cargo holds that could easily be converted into dormitories capable of holding up to 700 steerage passengers on outward voyages and general cargo on return trips to London. She also carried a crew of 154. After a successful set of sea trials held on October 23, 1908, she was turned over to her new owners and immediately began her short career. She left London on her maiden voyage on November 5, 1908, commanded by Captain Joshua Edward Ilbury, a veteran of the Blue Star Line with 30 years of experience. During this first voyage, she suffered an engine room fire that was quickly brought under control and repairs were made in Sydney. She completed the voyage, returning to London on March 7, 1909. Upon his return, Captain Obery was apparently not completely satisfied with the ship and was said to have reported that she suffered stability issues, making it especially difficult to properly load cargo. In hindsight, it's difficult to know the extent of Captain Ilbury's concerns, which were scrutinized by the later inquiry and heavily sensationalized by the press at the time. Ilbury was an experienced and well-respected captain, and despite whatever concerns he might have had, he considered the Waratah safe enough to embark on her next voyage, a voyage that would prove to be her last. Waratah is a species of flower native to the southeastern part of Australia and a state emblem of New South Wales. The name Waratah comes from the Eora Aboriginal people who inhabited the area that would become Sydney. In 1848, a ship bearing the name Waratah was lost in the English Channel. Another was lost on a voyage to Sydney in 1887, and yet another was lost in the Gulf of Carpentaria in 1897. In total, at least four vessels with the unlucky name were lost before Blue Anchor Line's Waratah sailed her final voyage in 1909. This voyage was only Waratah's second, leaving London on April 27, 1909. The first few legs were uneventful as she made her stops in South Africa, but she faced severe gales as she made her way from Adelaide to Melbourne. She reached Sydney in June without any damage or noteworthy issues. She left Sydney loaded with 7,800 bars of bullion, wool, frozen meat, dairy, and flour on June 26, and picked up additional cargo and passengers in Adelaide and Melbourne. She left Australia on July 7th with about 100 passengers bound for her stops in South Africa. During this leg of the voyage, first-class passenger Claude Gustav Sawyer, a Swiss-born engineer living with his family in Sussex, 
grew concerned as he observed several issues with the ship's stability. He claimed that even in calm seas, the ship had a considerable list to starboard and would unexpectedly recover with a sudden jerk so violent that it injured two passengers, Mrs. Cawood, who would disembark in Durban, and Miss LaSales, as well as the ship's surgeon, Dr. Howard Fulford. He made it widely known to his fellow passengers that he was concerned the Waratah was an unhappy ship. Mr. Sawyer was a well-educated and seasoned traveler. He understood how a properly designed ship should behave in a variety of conditions. But as the liner continued, her ever-present list had eased to only a few degrees, and soon Mr. Sawyer nearly forgot his concerns. But then, three or four days out of Durban, he dreamed of the strange apparition with the sword and the blood-soaked rag. He would have the same nightmare each of his remaining nights on the ship. Another passenger, Mr. Ebworth, when asked what he made of the vision, said it was probably a warning. This was enough for Mr. Sayer, and he decided that he would get off the ship in Durban and finish his journey on another liner. He tried to convince other passengers to do the same, but no one joined him. Claude Sawyer left the ship when she arrived in Durban on the morning of July 25th. The next day, the Waratah left Durban, bound for Cape Town, South Africa. Mr. Sawyer had one last nightmare a few days later, on July 28th. He saw the ship in the distance, fighting through heavy seas, when a huge wave swept over her, rolling her onto her starboard side. She soon disappeared beneath the waves. The Waratah was expected to reach Cape Town on the 29th of July. Her disappearance launched a considerable search effort, numerous claim sightings, and wild speculation over what could have happened to the brand new liner and the 211 souls on board. The last confirmed sighting of the SS Waratah came from the steamship Clan McIntyre at around 4 o'clock on July 27th. The two vessels communicated by signal lamp as the newer and faster Waratah overtook the older steamer near the mouth of the Beishi River and eventually faded into the horizon at 9.30. The weather in the area deteriorated rapidly and a storm rolled in the next day on July 28th. The captain of the Clan McIntyre would later report that it was some of the worst conditions he had ever experienced in his 13 years at sea. As the Waratah's scheduled arrival time came and went, concern slowly grew. It was not at all uncommon at the time for vessels to arrive a day or two, or even a few weeks late. While the Waratah was a new and modern ship, she was not equipped with a wireless set, leaving her to face emergencies on her own. The tugboat T.E. Fuller was the first vessel sent to search for the lost liner on August 1st, but they were soon forced to return due to harsh weather. The search quickly resumed and was joined by the Royal Navy cruisers HMS Pandora, Forte, and Hermes. They concentrated in the area where she was last spotted, but encountered waves so large that HMS Hermes suffered hull damage and had to be placed in dry dock for repairs. There were numerous reported sightings of the Waratah and reports of debris and even bodies sighted in the area, but none of these reports were ever definitively confirmed. In September of 1909, the Blue Anchor Line chartered the Union Castle cargo ship Sabine to conduct a search that covered 14,000 miles but nothing was found. In 1910, relatives of the Waratah's passengers sent another search party in a desperate attempt to find the missing ship. They chartered the Wakefield, which would spend another four months searching, covering an additional 15,000 miles. But again, despite these exhaustive efforts, no trace of the missing Waratah or her passengers was ever found. In December 1910, the Board of Trade conducted an official inquiry into the disappearance, but with the lack of evidence or witness testimony, they struggled to find a definitive explanation for the disaster. In the years that followed, numerous theories have been entertained, but there are two that seem to carry the most weight. The first and most popular is that the ship was top-heavy and prone to stability issues that proved catastrophic in the heavy seas Waratah no doubt faced after she overtook the Clan McIntyre on July 27th. The official inquiry spent much of its time going over the plausibility of this theory. The Waratah was based heavily on the design for the Geelong, which by this point had been sailing for years and had proved itself safe and reliable. 
Numerous expert witnesses agreed that she was built and designed properly, and she also just passed numerous inspections by her builders, her owners, the Board of Trade, and two separate inspections from Lloyds of London, which gave her their top rating. Still, rumors of instability persisted from passengers on her maiden voyage and others familiar with the vessel. One former passenger even reported that it was impossible to take baths on the ship at times due to the severe and persistent list. There was also, of course, the testimony of Mr. Sawyer, who was so concerned by these issues that he left the ship. But for all the accounts of stability issues that came out during the inquiry, there were just as many accounts praising the ship and her performance. Agnes Hay, a passenger on the Waratah's ill-fated final voyage, was actually also a passenger on her first voyage. She wrote to friends and family, telling them how satisfactory she found the ship, and complimented the officers and crew. Clearly, she was confident enough in the liner to book passage for a second voyage. If Waratah was plagued by such severe stability issues, how did she clear every inspection? Why did passengers, crew, and officers remark on how fine a ship she was? And why would Captain Ilbury, an experienced and well-regarded captain, deem her safe? At the time, it wasn't all that uncommon for passenger ships to be slightly top-heavy, even major transatlantic liners. The Imperator, for example, built just a few years later, was famously unstable, earning the nickname Limperator. So it's hard to know whether a handful of passengers were reacting, in hindsight, to perhaps heavy but somewhat normal rolling, or if the Waratah in fact did suffer a significant design flaw that left her vulnerable to capsizing. If she was unstable, it's a terrifying sight to imagine, as she would likely have gone over in minutes or even seconds. The people on board would have almost no time at all to comprehend what was happening or attempt an escape. But there's another chilling theory that gets less attention now, though it saw considerable speculation in the press at the time. This was that the Waratah suffered an explosion that caused the liner to sink almost instantly. One disputed eyewitness account gives credence to this theory. At around 7.30 p.m. on July 27th, Captain John Bruce of a ship called the Harlow and other members of his crew saw two mast lights about 10 miles away from a ship emitting an abnormally large amount of smoke. Soon after spotting the mysterious ship, they saw two broad fantail flashes on the horizon that they thought were likely caused by a bunker or boiler explosion. The lights and smoke from the nearby ship vanished almost immediately after the blast. The most glaring issue with the Harlow sighting is that its location contradicts the confirmed sighting from the Clan McIntyre, as the McIntyre communicated with the Waratah further along in their course to Cape Town, hours earlier that same day. The only way the Harlow could have seen the Waratah at the coordinates Captain Bruce provided is if the Waratah for some reason turned back to Durban. Captain Bruce and his crew were adamant about what they saw and the captain even went so far as to suggest that they run a wire to search for the wreck three to four miles from the mouth of the St. John River where they saw the burning ship explode. A boiler explosion might not be a far-fetched explanation, especially considering that the Waratah suffered an engine room fire not long before. It's possible that the fire left more significant damage to one of her boilers than what was detected at the time, leading to an eventual explosion. While nothing was ever officially confirmed, there were some reports of charred wreckage found in the area, and there have been other explosions at sea that took vessels down quickly with minimal debris left on the surface. But with all of this, it's important to take these accounts with a grain of salt. Many were recollections from months after events took place. Many were relayed through newspaper accounts looking to report a dramatic story, and many have been distorted by the passage of time. The Waratah disaster proved devastating for the Blue Anchor Line. Their reputation never recovered from the incident, and they eventually sold their fleet to P&O. We will probably never know what really happened to the 211 souls who vanished with the Waratah over a century ago. Numerous efforts to find her wreck over the years have so far proven unsuccessful. And with the vastness of the sea and the passage of time, it's likely she will never be found. Perhaps it makes no difference to the people who lost their lives, but to us, the uncertainty of tragedies like the Waratah not our desire to understand the world we live in. If something happens to someone we love, we want to know why. We want a complete story with a satisfying ending. But as our tools to make sense of the world fail, 
the unknowns pile up, we're left adrift, wondering what will eventually come for us. When you think of a ghost ship, what comes to mind? Do you picture some version of the Flying Dutchman, a phantom vessel, sailing on its own? Or is it something like the Waratah, a ship filled with people that simply vanished without a trace? Maybe you picture the fictional Octavius, a derelict ship filled with the skeletons of her crew, drifting aimlessly through the vast emptiness of the sea. It's hard to grasp the intense isolation and uncertainty of ocean travel in the days before wireless communication. A time when crossing the horizon meant passing into the unknown. Uncertainty is one of our greatest fears. We try to keep it at bay with stories crafted to fill in the blanks. But even our most fanciful tales fail to explain the great unknowability of the sea. Legends and superstitions arise, and none capture the imagination quite like a ghost ship. A spooky tale that explains away the unknowable. While many of these stories are just fiction, others are all too real. A select few are told time and again, like the Mary Celeste. But others are almost completely forgotten. Their mystery deepens as time erases the details. This is one of those stories, the real tale of the sailing vessel Resolven, often referred to as the Welsh Mary Celeste. From the moment European explorers arrived in present-day Newfoundland, it was immediately clear that the region's waters were rich with fish. These valuable natural resources led to a series of conflicts as the colonists vied for control. In 1713, the French and British agreed to the Treaty of Utrecht, in which France recognized Britain's claim to the island, but allowed the French to fish the waters off the western shore. This agreement called the Treaty Shore or French Shore, was reaffirmed and maintained through the 20th century. While this agreement was largely respected, tensions and war between the French and British led to a fraught relationship in the region. Ever suspicious of their longtime rival, the British maintained several Royal Navy ships in the area to routinely patrol and keep an eye on the French fishermen in what was called the Fishery Protection Service. By the late 1800s, as relations between the two countries grew friendlier, these patrols became somewhat uneventful. On August 28, 1884, one of these patrol ships, the gunboat HMS Mallard, under the command of Lieutenant Hamilton Brown, left St. John's and sailed northwest on what was expected to be another one of these routine voyages. By the next morning, August 29th, the weather was beautiful, offering gorgeous vistas of the surrounding area. As they steamed across the mouth of Trinity Bay, 30 miles east of Catalina, a large iceberg was spotted glistening in the distance, and a fog bank hung on the horizon out to sea. The peaceful morning was broken when a lookout called out, Sail Ho! At first, the sighting was only acknowledged by the responsible officers, but soon, as it came into better view, every man on deck stared at the mysterious ship that loomed on the horizon. It was a brig, under plain sail, but she sailed erratically, as if no one was controlling the vessel. When they grew closer, they noted some superficial damage. Her headgear was smashed, and some of the yards were broken off at the tip. Her lifeboats were missing, and no one seemed to be on deck. The men repeatedly hailed the strange ship, but they received no reply. Finally, Commander Brown ordered an officer and a small crew to board the ship and investigate. They lowered a boat and began rowing over. 
The mood was tense as the phantom vessel grew closer. They passed under her counter stern and read her name in home port. Reselvin, Aberist with Wales. The vessel was ominously quiet as she creaked with the waves. Her derelict sails flapped in the breeze, and water gently lapped at her hull. No one called out or greeted them, or begged for help. The occasional gull shrieked overhead. Their boat bumped up against the hull, and the men cautiously boarded the vessel. As they climbed on deck, they found a perfectly seaworthy ship, with only minor superficial damage. Splitting up, they began a thorough search. They expected to find something horrible, but instead they found a ship deserted but in near perfect order. In the captain's cabin, they found the logbook lying open on a table and the chronometer ticking away. In the crew and passenger quarters, they found clothing and other personal effects undisturbed. Even the fire in the galley stove was still burning. It was as if everyone on board simply vanished. The last entry in the captain's logbook was made only six hours before and indicated nothing out of the ordinary. Baffled, the men returned to the Mallard and reported their findings. Captain Brown assigned a skeleton crew to man the derelict vessel, and they spent the next few hours cruising the area, searching for survivors in the water. But nothing was ever found. Finally, a tow line was established, and the Mallard towed the Resolvent back to shore, where further investigations were carried out. Commanded by Captain John James, the Resolvin was a 143-ton wooden merchant brig. She typically sailed between Wales and various Canadian ports carrying timber and cod. She left Harbour Grace on August 27, 1884, bound for Snug Harbour in Labrador, where she would pick up a load of salted cod. On this voyage, she had a crew of eight, mostly Welsh sailors, and four local passengers. No trace of them was ever found. The incident ignited a fury of speculation over their fate. The leading theory related back to the large iceberg spotted by the Mallard just before the derelict vessel was discovered. It was speculated that the Resolvin might have collided with the iceberg in the night, and thinking the ship was more severely damaged than she actually was, she was abandoned. Captain James and his passengers and crew then drowned when their small lifeboat was swamped in the open sea. But Captain James was an experienced navigator who had sailed all over the world, and his first mate, James Matthias, was another deeply experienced sailor. It's hard to believe that the captain would order his men to abandon the ship without being absolutely certain that there was no other option. Some even believe that the Resolvin could have hit the iceberg after she was abandoned. Another theory posits that the Resolvin might have gotten lost in the fog and collided with the rocks off Random Island. But this raises the same question. Why would the men abandon a perfectly seaworthy vessel? With few answers to the mystery, the Resolvin was sold and re-entered service. Three years later, she was wrecked while sailing to Newfoundland with a load of lumber. As the years went on, the mystery of the ghost ship Resolvin faded from memory. But then, in 2013, the great-grandson of Captain James received an email from a Canadian woman with family in Deer Harbor, Newfoundland. She wrote that her grandfather and his older brother found a body on a small island off the coast of Random Island the same month and year the Resolvin was found abandoned. The body supposedly wore a captain's uniform and sat at a tree facing out to sea. The discovery was never reported and the body was buried in an unmarked grave. The woman admitted that while the story had been passed down through her family, she was never able to verify whether or not it was true. But her grandfather and his brother 
somehow came into some money at around the same time. Captain James was carrying a large sum of money during the voyage, which was also never found. His widow wrote numerous letters to the Admiralty, begging for any information on her missing husband and the money that should have gone to her. It never did, and she died in poverty. Whether this story is true, or even related to the ghost ship, will never be known. Like the Mary Celeste, the story of the Resolvin leaves more questions than answers. As time passes, stories change, details are forgotten or embellished, and uncertainty creeps in as everything fades into the ether of time. Thank you.